My name is Roger Dixon, and uh, this is a very unique meeting. In fact, it would be a uh, historical meeting because of what we are calling upon everyone to do. Something that we have always wanted to do, but have had difficulty in establishing a foundation. And that foundation that we are trying to go throughout the world right down to Subakim is to re-establish again the gospel as our foundation. Amen. People want to come together. They are tired of being separated from one another. The devil is just too strong. And we must come together as a united force in order to combat the devil, to save our children, to save our communities, to save our families. And to do that, we must be one, united together. One of the few prayers that Jesus made was that they all, that's us, may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Yes. And then also, he made a statement concerning love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love, one for another. Sometimes we behave so unloving. But when we talk about gospel, we must be talking about loving one another. This morning I want to introduce to you a concept of how that is done. God is love. I don't know if you have a pencil and paper. I'm going to forget about reading the Bible. I'll just have a quote from passages. But there are a lot of passages that you must write down. Sometimes I have found that people know concepts throughout the Bible. Here comes the light. People know concepts. They pick out a concept here and an idea there, but they have a difficult time in connecting them together. When we talk about the gospel, we are talking about connecting all the ideas, connecting the dots, because the gospel is a united effort on the part of God in order to produce a united response on the part of man. That's us. If there is not a united response, it is not God's fault. It's our fault. So when I use the word gospel, I'm talking about a God who work as one in order to bring unity among us. Let's begin. The word gospel is an English word. All it means is good news. So it makes it easier when we preach in Jesus just to use the word gospel. And I will use that instead of saying good news. Well, what is the good news? What is the gospel? Now I've got to get you awake. Wake you up. You know what this is? What am I holding up? I'm going to make a statement to wake you up. This is not the gospel. You wait. <laughs> you start it. 
We let a false prophet come in and us. Yes. I'll say it again. This is not the gospel. I'm not sweating because <laughs> you know this stone me. In two minutes, I can prove to you that you will agree with me 100%. Write down 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul writing to the Corinthians. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes these words. I make known unto you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive. The Holy Spirit is inspiring him to write this, you understand, in this Bible. Brethren, I make known unto you the gospel which I preach to you. The gospel is not the words that he is using to write. That's the Holy Spirit's business. <clears throat> which also you receive, in which also you stand. That's the Holy Spirit guiding him to write those words. But he is talking about the gospel. You pick up on that? I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you. The gospel is something that is preached. These words that are talking about the gospel are the words the Holy Spirit is guiding Paul to write. What is the gospel? He comes down to the centrality of the gospel, the most important part. And then we will broaden the gospel to understand it better. For I delivered unto you first of all. In other words, that makes it priority. That makes it first. That makes it above everything else. When I go preach, I preach the gospel first. I do not preach church. Church is us. Church is people. That is not the subject of my preaching. I preach gospel. Why that? You don't understand the event. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. That, my friend, is gospel. It is a historical event. It actually happened. They nailed him to the cross. He died there on that cross for my sins. That is gospel. Not the words that Paul is writing here to explain that. That Christ died for our sins, not all. That's not all the gospel. But that he rose again the third day before the church. That was a historical event. That's awesome. He died for my sins. That's good news. It's he was resurrected from the dead. That's good news. That is gospel. This is the newspaper. Right? This is the report. That's what he just wrote. A report. This is not the gospel. This is the report of the gospel event. Now we got that straight? You agree with me? Yeah. Alright. Spare myself being stoned. <laughs> Sometimes for preachers for a year, you hear that said, hold this up. You must obey the gospel. Well that's true. But I do not look through here for laws and rituals to obey. I look through here for information about this Jesus. About this Jesus who was 
in the flesh, but not always. I want to know where he came from. I want to know what he did on that cross. I want to know the results of that cross. So, let's begin with a major concept. All of you are here because you made a decision. There are really only three ways you can live. You can live like a pagan. Those people are not here. Well, at least most of them are not here. You can live like an unbeliever, can't you? Go to the shaveen, get drunk, commit fornication, whatever. You can live like a pagan. Don't believe in God. Or create your own God. After your own imagination. A God that will bow to your desires. Idolatry. You can live like faith. Number two, you can live religiously. You can live like a good religious person. Right down there, Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, the Old Testament law. But hang on. This is the book of Galatians. In chapter 1, verse 13, I'm wondering why God sent His Son at that particular time in history. In the fullness of time, God sent for His Son. Why that time? He could have done any time during the Roman Empire, which was for 1,000 years, according to prophecy. He could have done down in the time of the Roman Empire. But why they? I think Galatians chapter 1, verse 13 begins to answer. In Galatians, this is written by the Apostle Paul. We know Paul before he was Paul. We know him as Saul, the persecutor of the church, Pharisee of Pharisees in the religion of the Jews. And in that passage, Paul said he was pretty good religious as a Jew. And in the passage, the Greek word has a real understanding that he was a Jew's religion. Judaism. That was a religion. It was a religion that was composed of rites, ceremonies, rituals, the traditions of the fathers. You know, right down there, chapter. Uh, Mark chapter 7, 1 through 9. You can read that later. Mark 7, 1 through 9. This is where Jesus confronts this religion. He confronts it head on. Even to the point, he says, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your traditions. That is religion. That's the definition of religion. There are many other passages that you could uh, put with that to define how one lives as a religious. Well, the best example is when Jesus gave the Jews. They were true religions. And at that time of history, they were the best religionists around. I'm telling you, those Jews perfected religion. Keep the Sabbath, that's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Sinai law, oh, it's good enough. But not good enough if you are a religious. Because a religion that says, on the Sabbath, you can only walk a certain distance. Sabbath day journey. That's nowhere in the Old Testament. That is an added law tagged on to, connected with 
the Sabbath. Just so you keep the Sabbath. That is what religion does. The Lord says to do this, and we start tagging on our traditions, our rituals, our ceremonies. Oh, we are good religionists. We're very good religionists. We don't have to invent religion. And I'm saying that the majority of the Christian world are religions. Does that scare you? Because in each one of us, there is the desire to obey God in a customary way. Look at your Sunday assembly. A customary ritual of Sunday morning assembly. My challenge to you is, where do you find all of those rituals that you behave on Sunday morning in your New Testament? Where are they? And if someone comes around and says, let's do it differently. <laughs> and so the older brothers and sisters say, no, no, this is the way we have always done it. This is our ritual. You are a religionist. <laughs> Confess it. <Yes>. Confess. <laughs> when you say prayers, as you come together, how do you say the prayers? How do you do your singing? A preacher stands up and preaches. That's not in the New Testament. <laughs> These are rituals that we have developed for ourselves. It's not always bad. Okay? It's not always bad to do things in a customary way. Because everybody knows what to expect. But keep in mind, when everybody does what is expected, as time goes on, it becomes a part of your religion. <laughs> and you're just like the Jews. <laughs> To the point that you will argue over the customary way of doing something and forget the law of God. Amen. It's the way we are. Right. So the second way you can determine to live is religiously. That can be your comfort. That can be your security. You can say, Brother John, I oh, use the English. Would you say the opening prayer for our assembly? Give me your name. Give me your opening prayer. <laughs> and then you go through a ritual of assembly. Brother Boston, please say the closing prayer. <laughs> you ever hear closing prayer? Read that in your New Testament. Opening, closing prayer. This is the hour of worship. You ever hear that? You ever read that in your Bible? This is all religion. We have manufactured this terminology, this behavior. This is religion. When the closing prayer is said, therefore, the husband and wife who were arguing with one another before the opening prayer, <laughs> when the opening prayer was said, shh, this is the hour of worship. <laughs> and so there is peace and calm. Yes. But when the glory prayer is over, and the husband and wife step outside the assembly, the storm. <laughs> they are practicing religion. Yeah. Yeah. That's the second way you can live. You can live by this. The third is gospel living. Gospel living. Gospel living is the totality of my life. There's no opening prayer to open up my religion. There is no closing prayer to turn God off. Yeah. And I'd be on my way. 
gospel living is out there in my community, with my family, with my neighbors. It's everywhere. Amen. They say today, 24 7. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That is gospel living. But I would say that most of us are trapped in bondage. And that bondage is our religiosity, our religion. Now, the Holy Spirit is not unwise to all of this. Galatians 5, verse 1. Write it down. Once you write it down, go home. Write it on a piece of paper. Put it up on your fridge. Put it up on your drawer. When you go to bed at night, they may put it on the ceiling and see it there. <laughs> Be not entangled again in a bondage. You've been set free. What gospel does is set us free from religion. It's bondage. And in order to be set free, you have to have been in bondage. And that's where the Jews were when Jesus came. They were in bondage. And to keep them in bondage, well, like we do. They had religious police. Call Pharisees. And they made sure you did not pick up your bed. Even though you were just healed, you did not pick up your bed and walk. Are you you're breaking the Sabbath? The religious police. And sometimes you're sick at home, can't go to the hour of worship, and the pastor gets up, the religious policeman says, Where were you? You are going to hell if you do that again. We sometimes as pastors, we become Pharisees, religious policemen. We're in bondage. We keep the people in bondage. We spill guilt upon the people in bondage. Give! And if you don't give, you're robbing God. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, I don't want to rob God. <laughs> <laughs> and the guilt is, is laid upon them. That is religion. Now then, gospel. See, when you understand what gospel is, you have to, the Israelites, when they were delivered from captivity. You remember that story? Moses brought them out of captivity and asked them to contribute. And finally, they kept contributing so much, Moses had to say, stop giving. You ever hear a pastor say, stop giving? Later. I'm just trying to connect with God. 
There was a jailer in his household. Household, wife, children, who could obey the Lord. And then the baptized an ex-patriot businesswoman. <laughs> who was that? Lydia. 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 Ex-patriot. She wasn't from there. She was a businesswoman. She sold her travel travel away. And her household. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy left the lit light, went on over to Thessalonica. Follow me? Luke, the doctor, stayed there. So you have three wage earners in the church of Philippi. The jailer, low income job working in the dungeons. Government worker. Lydia, traveling sales woman. And then look, if he got his doctor business going, Maybe he made a little money. Three wages. But well, some time went by and a famine occurred down in Judea. And so the churches, the disciples all up through those areas, decided to take up a contribution and send it down to the Jews in Judea. And the contribution was coming from the Gentiles of Macedonia. When in Christ they'll never forget there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Mm. We are all one man in Christ. <laughs> and if you're still looking at color, you do not have the gospel in the way. So the evangelist went on preaching the gospel. And we don't know exactly what happened until many years later when Paul wrote a letter to those Philippians. Oh, you Philippians know, Philippians chapter 4, at the beginning of the gospel with you, no church, this is Lydia, the jailer, and Luke, no church, this is a little church, well, small, Lydia, the jailer, the household, their household, and Luke. Luke was a single man, by the way, at that time. Okay? No church had fellowship with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you only. Isn't that beautiful? Now, in Acts chapter, you might write this down, Acts chapter 16, verse 12, he stood in on the sign. Paul, Silas, and Timothy stayed in the Levi. The passage says, Acts 16, 12, few days. Few days. That's not few weeks, few months, few years. Few days. So when Paul said, no church had fellowship with me in the matter of getting received, but you only, you who were only few days as Christians, that ties out of pagan idolatry. Just you. What makes people do that? Being a disciple a few days, and yet the gospel is going to go preach, be preached in Thessalonica, and so you send once and again, not just one time. Oh, he's out of out of out of, out of sight, out of mind. Huh? If you are a gospel living person and the gospel is being preached somewhere, it is not out of sight, out of mind. It is my responsibility to preach the gospel to the world. And I obey that gospel, therefore it is my responsibility to find somebody through whom I can get that gospel message going. I'm a businessman. I have to stay here. Lydia couldn't go. The janitor couldn't go. But I can say it. And how shall they preach? Unless they be saved. Was it a message in Romans? Yeah. What makes people do that? When you obey the death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel. That's what we learned. It? When you obey that, you take on the responsibility of preaching that same message to the world. If you do not, you 
do not know God. Mm -hmm. And I have a passage for that. And if I remember, I'll bring it up to you. <laughs> but I may not remember. <laughs> you just say, bring it up. What do you mean? I don't know God if I don't deal with this gospel thing. I really don't know God. Mm -hmm. Were they rich, poor, and live by? Second Corinthians chapter 8, 1 through 4. Paul says, he's writing to the stingy Corinthians. Brethren, I make known to you. He said, I want to let you know about the churches of Macedonia. That out of their deep poverty, they were willing to give. In fact, he said they went beyond their poverty. They went beyond what they could give. Here are poor, poor people giving and yet sacrificing, joining in, joining in the sacrifice to make sure that gospel is preached in other areas. Be careful. That is what gospel living would be. If you understand this gospel, it is going to touch your heart more than anything in the world. If you are a religious, it is going to be a revelation. The Philippians, what they did is a revelation. How can poor people, extremely poor people, give to the evangelists? And then later, hear about a famine. And they give down there. That's the context of 2 Corinthians 8. There was a famine down there, and they gave out of their poverty in order to send a contribution down to the famine victims. What makes people do that? It's the gospel. Now, if you want to know the extent, you better be ready. Because the Word of God is not me. Okay? All I am is a dot connector. Okay? That's all I am. It's not me. You need to understand this. It's the gospel. It's where the power is. Not in any man. Sometimes pastors flatter themselves. Yeah, they get up and they're great speakers. We get up, I used to when I was younger, man, I would pull my heart out. And then after I preached that sermon, I'd run to the back. And as the people would go out, oh, brother, that was a fine sermon. That was a fine, uplifting sermon. Thank you, Brother Dixon. I'll be back next Sunday. Thank you. Oh, I just come. And you know what it is? I study hard. That's religion. Because I was preaching as a system of self-sanctification. That's why they find religion. We've got to continually define this religion. I do good works in order to sanctify myself, to make myself feel better about myself. I need a pat on the back so I can go on for another day. If you live in the gospel, Jesus gave you one pat on the back at the cross, and that will last you a life. He washed away all my sins. Yes. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Write it down. Romans 5, 8. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I was a bad boy, and yet He still died in that cross. If you lack self-esteem, gospel will set you up. If you fall down, the gospel will bring you back up. There is the power of the gospel. I'm not done yet. I don't have much time. Yet. But I pray for this forever and ever. I want you. In the beginning, give us one one. In the beginning. You know who was there? You know who was there? Verse 26, Genesis 1 26. Let us make man in or after our 
and led us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. John 1, write this down. John 1, oh boy, this is going to get hard. Hang on, Pastor. Now, you might mention one of my mission is to be a pastor to pastors. Because you know what? I was, as a young pastor, I made all of the mistakes. I had all of that energy. And it took years to develop out of that. I was kind of like a John Mark, okay? John Mark, he was young, right? And Paul and Barnabas go on a mission journey. Oh man, this is great. We're going to travel, see the world. Gets his passport, signs up with the uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas team, and he heads on out. Well, going through Cyprus, that's okay. That's where Uncle Barnabas was from. I've been here, no problem. And then he comes to the coast of Southern, which is modern-day Turkey there. He looks up there and there's some mountains of Pamphylia. Man, they are snow-capped. It's getting tough. See, John Mark grew up in the city, down in Jerusalem. He was a city boy. And probably the final supper of the Lord was in John Mark's uh, mother's house. Could have been. And it had two stars, big upper room. He had a wall out there. He's, he's a spoiled city boy. And he saw those mountains. Then he said, I'm going home to Mama. <laughs> and he did. Young. Okay. Then he came around to the second time Paul said to Barnabas, after two years, we got to go back and visit those places we went to on the first missionary journey where John Mark went on. Barnabas says, no, i got to take Mark with me. He's my cousin. He's family. I've got to take him. Paul says, no, he's not ready. And they fussed over the matter. And so Paul took Silas, Barnabas took John Mark, and went to familiar territory. But later, as the years went by, Paul, in his last letter, he wrote something. Timothy, from prison. Mm, bring John Mark, for he is profitable for me, for the ministry. Gospel living is something you grow in. <coughs> Colossians chapter 3. Just all of Colossians 3, okay? If you have been raised from Christ, with Christ from the water of baptism, put on, put off, focus on places, those things that are above. It is a growth thing. You know, as a young pastor, I was growing, growing. Because as a young pastor, we have to you know. We want to go to the back. We want to get the clap on the back. We want to encourage you. But sooner or later, you start realizing, no, that's not why I'm here. There's gospel in my heart. And if I don't do it, I feel bad. And if I do it, I feel good. That's when the gospel takes over and your pride subsides, goes away. So in the beginning was the Word, John chapter 1, 1 and 2, verse 14, right there, there. John chapter 1, 1 and 2, 14. In the beginning was the Word. John 4, 24, write that one down. God is finished. Finished. God is Spirit, right? God is Spirit. You know that, right? Okay, you know that? Yes. Now, don't be like, I had 75 pastors. I've been northern black. And I asked all of them, I said, okay, we're here together. Have to, we had a study for a week. This is the one day. We had a whole week. Okay? Okay. How many of you believe that God has a nose? <laughs> yeah. How many of you believe God has an eye? Yeah. Has an ear? Now I'm not going to hold up your hair. Don't hold up your hair. But if you want to hold up your hair, you 
than they deny the gospel. You deny the gospel. Sometimes Satan creeps in that with childish imagination, he starts to work on the minds of his people to deny the eternal gospel Amen. of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So you ask how? Why? In the beginning was the Word. Genesis 1, in the beginning. That was creation. Now it's time to create something different. In the beginning was the Word, John. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know the message, don't you? The Word was Spirit. God is Spirit. He has no eye. He has no ear. He has no feet. Those are metaphors. Figures of speech. Metaphors. Figures of speech. And I always tell people, if you don't understand what metaphor is, you cannot understand the Bible. You cannot understand prophecy. You might as well throw your Old Testament away. Throw the book of Psalms away. It's all metaphorical language. And that's the beauty of it. Something earthly, metaphor, use something earthly, something I can identify, to explain something spiritual and heavenly. That's what metaphor is. Types of metaphor. Similes, like comparison, using like or as. And those are metaphors. You need to go home and Google that. <laughs> okay. Look at the dictionary. Get out your old English book. I found in Africa, you know, in Africa, most languages do not have a word for metaphor. Do you know that? And we speak in metaphors all the time. Oh, I scared him so bad, he ran like a rat. <laughs> Does that mean he was a rabbit? <laughs> he ran like, comparison using like a rat. That's a metaphor. God sees with an all-seeing eye. Does that mean God has an eye? Come on, hello, people. Hello, we're educated, okay? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was Spirit. In verse 14, and the Word became Amen. You got it. If God the Son already had an ear, what is verse 14? He became flesh. You got a flesh ear now? No. It is what is called incarnation. Incarnation. And you know, in the Romance languages, French, French, uh, Romanian, Italian, Portuguese, English, what's the other? Spanish. Those are the five Romance languages. They all have the word incarnation. 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 Of course, does not have the word. That's the process. Zulu? Amanda? Is that a word for that? That word can be used in several minor, definitive ways, but only truly in reference to God. Do you know that? Only truth can incarnation be used in reference to God, who was in spirit, but he became flesh. Listen up, this is gospel business I'm talking to you about. This is gospel. Some of you think, okay, the gospel is only the death of Jesus on the cross. But listen, you missed something. Something died up there. Something bled. And it was an incarnate God. Incarnate. A God that existed in spirit. But He came to be in the flesh of man. And therefore, what does that have to do or deal with me? Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. You write this one down. Put this on the fridge. Beginning in verse 5. 
we go through verse 11, so we'll just do the first few verses. Have this mind in you. Now this is gospel thinking. This is a gospel mind. Have this mind in you, Paul says, which was also in Christ Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, God said, let us make man. In the beginning, in God the Son, He had this mind in Him. And I live the gospel. I must have that mind in me. This religion business, that's just junk. You've got to live to work that stuff out of your thinking and bring in the thinking, the mind of Jesus. Amen. And until you do, you're still stuck in religion. Showing up every Sunday morning, going through the performance, closing off God with a closing prayer, and going on, I feel good now, and I feel good. You may have even thrown in a rain. God says on the way, God, don't remember my contribution back there. I gave. That's religion. You mean a poor man on the way home? Oh, I gave back there to church. <laughs> no. That's religion. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, mm. who existing in the form of God, the Spirit, you see, counted not the being on an equality with God or equal with God, but He emptied Himself. He emptied Himself of eternal existence, of Spirit with God, Made in the form of man, the Word became flesh, becoming obedient even unto death, yea, the death mm. of the cross. Mm. That is the incarnational journey right. of Jesus. Mm. And you come with, to me with a sense of pride? That's disgusting. Yes. You are arrogant. You do not know this God who has a heart for me so much that He loved me so much that He gave through incarnation His only begotten Son that I might live with Him forever. You just don't understand, my friend. You don't. You need to repent. Have this mind.